All right, folks, we're going to dive right in. Nice. Grab your drink, grab your snack, grab your seat. Well, I hope everybody was, uh, I hope everybody else's brain is as full as mine after hearing those, uh, our, our doctors speak. I know there's a lot of stats that are often shared, but I'll tell you something. What I have, d I have discovered at the hospital is that there's only one number that really drives all of this, and that's the number one. That for one second, none of our team wants you to think you could be getting care better somewhere else. And I hope that was clear, that there's an absolute commitment to ensuring that you have the care and resources that you need. I, I must tell you, I've got 50 questions here. And so what that tells me is there is a huge interest in what the doctors presented on, but it also tells me that we are not going to have the ability to get through all of these. But again, in the spirit of being so committed, the, the team up here has said we will get through those in another way. I'm going to ask as many as I can. We're going to power through. And if there are still questions to be asked, we will get those answers to you in another way. All right? And so with that, I'm going to dive right in. And so a question to the panel. What are the side effects of hormonal therapy? It came up a number of times. So in terms of uh, hormonal therapy, probably... Uh, the main thing people are asking about are these LHRH agonists or antagonists, which are those injectable medications that lower the testosterone levels and stop the testicles from making male hormones. So the primary side effects um, are fatigue, uh, hot flashes, uh, decreased sexual libido, erectile dysfunction, osteoporosis, and uh, decreased muscle mass. I don't know if there's anything anyone else wants to add on there. Metabolic syndromes, things, weight gain, um, problems with uh, sort of insulin resistance and diabetes called metabolic syndrome and possible cardiovascular risks. Excellent, excellent, thank you. At what stage do you recommend brachytherapy? Came up a number of times. Yeah, sorry, uh, time didn't allow me to uh, get into the details about brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is an alternative to surgery and external beam radiotherapy. I focused on external beam radiotherapy. For men with, uh, with, for many men with localized prostate cancers. Now, typically, um, brachytherapy has been used in the past for men with low and intermediate risk prostate cancers, but it's increasingly used now in higher risk patients when it's given in combination with a shorter course of external beam radiotherapy. So, the short answer is it can be used really across the board in localized prostate cancer. In more favorable cancers, it's used on its own and in higher risk cancers, it's used in combination with external beam radiotherapy. Wonderful. Um, is Gleason 7 still the benchmark for surgery or radiation? Yeah, Gleason 7 is really the dividing line on this sort of the scale of aggressiveness for prostate cancer that once you hit 7 or above, we know from good studies that you have a high risk of going on to metastatic disease if it's left untreated. And so therefore, if you're somebody who's fit enough and, and has uh, expected survival uh, of 10 years or more, then we feel that you should have treatment for Gleason 7 or higher. Okay. Can the protein insertion process be used for metastatic prostate cancer to confirm location of cancer? Um, I think that question is referring to um, using molecules to identify uh, prostate cancer throughout the body, maybe via PET scans, and uh, yes, in the case of metastatic cancer in some unique uh, circumstances that, and that we're still researching, a PET scan may be valuable, but I would just kind of caution that it is only in certain circumstances that we would consider uh, using a PET scan, a CT scan, or an MRI, or a bone scan are still the standard of care right now for uh, looking for metastatic disease outside of the prostate. And just to add a quick thing, um, so Luke's correct. I think that it's important to remember that uh, many of these PET scans are not available yet in Ontario or Canada. I have a few patients who are willing to go out of the country to get them if I think it's important, but it's pretty expensive. And I think, um, you know, Ontario is taking a very evidence-based approach, which is correct. So I'd be cautious if you go to your urologist or your doctor and say, look, I want one of those PET scans because they say it's a great thing at the conference on Saturday. You're not likely to be able to just get a PET scan. It has to be for very specific indications. Thank you. 
in the removal of prostate, why, when would a surgeon not resort or use robotics? So, uh, not everybody is trained on how to perform robotic surgery, and uh, clearly the most important thing uh, for a patient is that the surgeon performs the procedure and the technique that they are best trained at and most comfortable with. Uh, if you do it a robotic approach or a sort of standard open approach with a, with a larger incision, both can be excellent operations, and it's important that your surgeon does it in the way they're most comfortable with. There are rare, but some circumstances where somebody has had a lot of previous surgery uh, on their bowels and things like that, where it might be advantageous to perform uh, an open prostatectomy compared to a robotic prostatectomy, but um, most patients are eligible, uh, and I think it's a good option for many patients, as long as their surgeon is trained in how to do this surgery well. Thank you. So a screening question. What if the cost of PSA testing came down? What would that mean? And does the use of urine testing show any promise? Excellent question. So really the cost of the PSA test is not the prohibitive factor. Um, as I laid out in my talk, really, the concern against PSA screening was not the cost of the population, but not, not a money cost, but really the cost with regards to harms, which were, again, overdiagnosis of non-significant cancers and the side effects of treatment. So I think the, the cost of the test itself is really not a barrier uh, in its use um, uh, from large government bodies. With regards to urinary markers, there are, uh, PCA3 is sort of the most uh, notable one. The performance characteristics of these tests really are, 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 are somewhat debatable. Um, there have been a number of tests trying to compare them to PSA testing to see if they can outperform PSA. There are some indications for them. There are some scenarios where they're helpful, provide additional information. However, nothing that is really a, an isolated urinary marker outperforms PSA on its own. There are some panels of tests that are done, put together urinary markers, but really, uh, as far as up today, they really haven't replaced PSA because they don't really have the data to support them. Okay. Um, to what extent do cancer cells move around within the prostate? Um, well, the cells themselves don't generally move around, but what we do know about prostate cancer is it tends to be a multifocal disease. So um, when we remove prostates uh, for people who have known cancers, often we find cancers in many areas around the prostate. Um, and that's one of the limitations for why focal treatment, just treating that part of the prostate doesn't work very well uh, because many people will have tumors sort of throughout the prostate or in many locations of the prostate. So when we treat with surgery or we treat with radiation, we generally treat the whole prostate. Okay. Um, if you're afraid of needles, what other tests, if any, can be done for PSA testing? Uh, I'll, I'll, answer, yeah, I'll answer that one. So uh, it's one of the things that we didn't really talk about but is very important and something that we advocate uh, is physical exam. And, um, and the rectal exam, the DRE, is a very important uh, screening practice that men should receive. So PSA is a part of the screening process, but getting your prostate checked by a doctor who is competent in checking the prostate is also uh, an important thing. The other thing you can do if you're afraid of needles is look away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, this is a big one. Again, came up a fair amount, but how does the Ottawa Hospital then work with other hospitals in our community so that patients have access to the same quality care if you live here in Ottawa? So we have a fairly unique, uh, well-developed program in our region. Um, it's called the Community of Practice. And it's kind of a model for the province. The province has tried to do this in every other Lynn. Uh, and so far, uh, nobody's come close to what's occurred here in the Champlain Lynn. That's what we call this region. So the community of practice is basically um, a group of physicians of various types. Everybody here on this panel is involved. Um, radiologists, nurses, hospital administrators from every hospital that treats prostate cancer. And we meet at least twice a year, and it's, it's moving up to four times a year, and we share data, we share the best practices that we have. And the idea is to try to make sure that if you're having surgery, for example, at 
the Montfort Hospital or at the Queensway Hospital or wherever else that you're getting very similar care if you had at the Ottawa Hospital and vice versa. So a s quick simple example of that is that there are these things called care pathways which are written out so you know exactly what's going to happen prior to your surgery, during your surgery and afterwards and your, and your follow up care and you'll get a copy of those care maps in your package when you come and we've made that pathway a regional pathway so it's not just Ottawa Hospital care pathway you get the same pathway at the Montfort or the Queensway and we've tried to standardize across the region so to sort of get back to Rodney's ships there. The idea is if we can try to increase the quality across the region then all of the ships come up with the level of the water and uh, so it, it's successful. I think we still have lots of projects to do but that's, uh, that's how we're addressing that. Excellent. Uh, what is the risk of testosterone treatments to former prostate cancer patients? So, uh, Who are supposedly cured is the last part of that. Yeah. So again, the concern here is, is there a causation or a driving role in testosterone and prostate cancer? So testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. There is a role with it in that if you do have prostate cancer, if prostate cancer exists, testosterone will drive it. And this is where the androgen deprivation therapy or the hormones as we're referring to them come in. They block testosterone, suppress the cancer, make it regress. So the concern is if somebody has been treated for prostate cancer, if you introduce a higher dose of testosterone, are you now going to induce a cancer? And the, the answer is no. If somebody is cured, if somebody has no further evidence of prostate cancer, you're not going to recause prostate cancer with testosterone. The concern comes in, is somebody genuinely cured? And so you have to be very cautious. I think in somebody with a, a relatively unaggressive cancer that has been well treated, they are disease free for a period of time. It's probably reasonable to introduce testosterone in those patients if they are genuinely symptomatic. We want to make sure that somebody is deficient and they have symptoms from that. And then in that setting, in a monitored, closely monitored environment, I think it is appropriate to do so. This does not mean that anybody who has ever had prostate cancer should receive testosterone. There are patients with higher grade tumors who may not be out of the woods yet, even if you are seeing an undetectable PSA. In those patients, it would certainly not be appropriate. And somebody with any evidence of prostate cancer that still exists, it would be inappropriate to do so. Okay. Um, what is the success rate with regards to complications, including incontinence and in, in impotence, following surgery? Did I read that so, wrong? Yeah. So okay. I, think the I think the question is, what are, what's the incidence of complications from surgery? And that is a very individualized answer. So when I showed the report cards uh, earlier, um, I don't know if I didn't really go into details of it, but surgery is not uniform for everybody. So people who, ha who we think have relatively low volume cancer that isn't growing outside of the prostate, we can do a nerve sparing procedure. And in that case, uh, the rates of permanent urinary leakage or permanent problems with erections are much lower compared to somebody who has very extensive disease where we're not able to spare those nerves. Um, so I think the key thing in terms of estimating risk of those complications, it depends on the age of the patient, the function of the patient prior to surgery, as well as the type of surgery that is performed. And there may be some variability in outcomes depending on who performs the procedure as well. And um, that's why uh, we feel it's a, a major step forward when you are seeing your, your surgeon that they can provide you with very specific risks of those complications afterwards. Some of those complications are short term, but some of those complications can be permanent as well. Uh, and it's important that patients are aware of all of the benefits and all of the potential risks associated with their unique circumstance. Okay. Does the research into using viruses to attack cancer cells envisage application to salvage therapy? Envisage application to salvage therapy? Yes, so that is um, the initial rollout. The plan is to look at two specific groups of patients. Uh, the one group that most medications are tried on patients first are people without any other therapeutic options. So they've had chemotherapy, they've had other medical treatments, 
and we want to see if there's some effect of these viral therapies or any new therapy in, in those patients who have no other good options. The other group of patients that we're looking to test this on are the group of patients where they have PSA recurrence, but they don't have any medical treatment options for them yet. So they may be on hormonal therapy or they may not be on, on hormonal therapy, but have a detectable PSA. That's what Dr. Morgan was speaking to earlier, which to me is one of the most exciting areas because I think if we are going to achieve cure with some of these new treatments, uh, the best time to cure this is in the early stages, especially after they've failed surgery or failed uh, radiation treatment. And uh, so we're looking at splitting um, our testing in the first group of probably 20 patients in each of those two categories uh, to look for ben potential benefit and also um, to try and make sure that there aren't too many toxic side effects. So you mentioned hormonal therapy. On average, how long does hormonal therapy last before it is no longer effective and cancer returns? So in terms of uh, these LHRH agonists or antagonists, um, about 80 to 90% have uh, effectiveness. So most people, we see a drop in their PSA. For some individuals, that response may last for a long time, but on average, we say about a year and a half, two years response rate. Yeah, I think it's completely dependent upon the cancer and its aggressiveness. So if you have a very high grade cancer that looks under the microscope looks very different from normal, so that would be like the very high Gleason grade, uh, then the response rate can be much, much shorter. We have patients who have lower grade cancers like sevens, Gleason sevens, or even some people who used to have like a six. Um, we'll sometimes see hormones work for many, many years. I mean, I've had patients, just anecdotally, who have had lymph node metastases alone, who've responded to hormones for 15 to 20 years, and others who, as Dr. Canel says, maybe respond for less than six to 12 months if they have a very aggressive cancer. So as I was discussing about combination therapy, so for patients who present with metastatic cancer de novo, in other words, that's the first presentation of metastatic disease, in those individuals that have um, quite extensive bony metastases or involvement of their organs, and those are the patients where it's really important that in addition to their androgen deprivation therapy that we're adding something else like chemotherapy and possibly in the future apparatural, just to kind of double hit that down because we're worried about those patients. Just okay. add that there's another yeah. population of patients that get started on hormonal therapy who don't have cancer that we can see on a scan. Their only sign of cancer is a rising PSA, and those patients can have control of their uh, cancer free of rising PSA for many years, five, seven years, a decade even some, sometimes. Okay. So this again came up quite a bit, and that's the work that's being done with family doctors. So it seems that new young doctors do not support PSA testing. What can be done to change this? How are you working with family doctors locally? This is a real problem in our community, this question says. Yeah, so this really stems to, uh, from the recommendations by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and the Canadian Task Force, which, again, uh, argued against or came out and, and stated against PSA screening. And so the younger generation of family physicians who were being trained, who grew up in that environment, were being taught that, you know, PSA screening is harmful. The updated recommendation that came out in April of this year, I think, will uh, help that uh, considerably um, about having an informed discussion with the individual patient. Um, so that, I think, is going to be a, a real benefit. The other is basically, as a uro urologic community, speaking to our family physician colleagues and um, making them aware of the intricacies of the data that they may not be aware of by hearing a blanket statement. So I think it comes from awareness and education amongst physicians, but also the guidelines uh, by the task forces having been modified, I think, will be very important as well. So what's the role of the patient in that then? Is there something we can be doing? Yeah, so I mean, as a patient individually, um, they should have a discussion with their physician. And you know, as a patient, you're entitled to get a PSA test and your physician should have that conversation with you. Um, there's obviously a cost involved in getting a PSA test, but uh, for most, the cost is not prohibitive. And I think that you can strongly tell your physician you wish a test and they should honor that um, in most scenarios. 
Um, so I think as a patient uh, group, uh, advocacy is important, and as an individual patient, uh, personal advocacy is important, and insisting that you want to test. Okay. Um, so for those of us who have had traditional surgical procedures, could you please describe essentially the biggest differences between that, between robotics and traditional surgery? Any concerns? Uh, so basically, uh, somebody who's done a lot of both now, um, I, you know, that's one of the issues with robotics is that many of the comparisons that we see in studies are between expert open surgeons and expert robotic surgeons and to be honest both are going to have really good outcomes and so therefore it's very hard to tease out the differences in the long term so you know we got when i was doing open prostatectomies i got very good at nerve sparing we had pretty good results good bladder control results and probably not much different than what i'm seeing today uh, I think that over time the robotic platform and the technology is going to improve and it's, we're going to see further improvements in those outcomes. More importantly, the, diff the main differences that we can really point to are kind of more short term. So, you know, my patients for open surgery used to stay in hospital for at least two, three days, sometimes a bit longer. Robotic, the average stay is about one day, so it's really an overnight procedure. Uh, you have multiple small cuts, like little bullet hole cuts, rather than one big cut. So the pain is much less. Um, you're up and around faster. Uh, the amount of blood that we lose is very much decreased with robotics. That little bit you saw on the screen is like a few cc's of blood. So the average, in our region, we measure transfusion rates for all surgeons, uh, surgeries. And for open surgery, the transfusion rate for this LIN is 10.5%. And for robotic surgery, it's about 0.5%. So there's a tremendous difference in transfusion rates. Um, there are some differences in long-term outcomes. There's a less urethral stricture or blockage of the urethra with robotics. Uh, I think people do get back to work faster. And uh, like I said, I think the future of surgery is to continue to advance this technology, not to go back and stick with open surgery, even though we got really good at it. And some people that still practice it are still really good at it. But I think open surgery has a ceiling and we kind of reached that ceiling and I think that technology with robotics does not yet have a ceiling so we're just going to keep getting better and better at it. So a follow up to that then that came up a couple of times. Apparently the Ontario government though says the costs are too high for robotics. At the Ottawa Hospital are you concerned about robotics continuing? Um, I mean cost is always a concern. I think that uh, we are all, all very cost conscious um, as being care providers within a publicly funded system. Uh, to us who have uh, a lot of experience in this, I think the cost is well worth it. If we were so the cost of a robotic procedure is somewhere around three to five thousand dollars more than the standard open approach. And so one of the issues is that um, because this is equipment and not a medication, uh, it has a different uh, lens that it's evaluated through. Uh, so one of our frustrations is that if there was a medication that dropped transfusion rates from 10% to zero or close to zero, uh, and it was a pill that cost $3,000, it would be funded without question. Uh, but because it is an instrument, it's looked at differently, and so the government has said we don't really want to fund it. Uh, now most hospitals recognize the value and in fact we have a large amount of data from the Ottawa Hospital showing all of the benefits that patients have received. So I don't think there's really any appetite on behalf of the hospital to change that because we recognize that the quality of care that we're able to provide is much higher. Um, but it does make it very difficult for our hospital administrators because these costs to robotic surgery has to come from the global budget uh, and there's not specific funding geared toward robotic surgery which is certainly disappointing. Um, that being said, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon at centers of excellence like ours. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the robotics that have been done already are based on patient donations and very generous uh, individuals within the Ottawa region uh, who have supported this because they've, they've benefited directly from, uh, from the program. So I think it's a concern, although I don't think it's... I think it's something that we have to work through. It's more of an administrative and financial issue. I think the data is very, very clear from our hospital and from the province. Um, it's just one of those bureaucratic uh, issues that we're trying to deal with. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, what is the future of brachytherapy? As I know, it was deleted as a, um, deleted at Juravinsky in Hamilton. Um, well, I think the future for brachytherapy is quite bright, and I can't speak to the, the particular cancer center you mentioned. I, I know that neighboring cancer centers to the Jerovinsky have very robust uh, brachytherapy programs that have been increasing in utilization, so that might explain why uh, it was uh, closed there. But um, I can tell you about at, at the Ottawa Hospital of, over the last uh, two to three years, we have um, started a what we call a high dose rate brachytherapy program, which takes advantages of um, improvements in, in ultrasound and other imaging over time and it allows us to give really quite precise and uh, sculpted doses of radiation um, in a single procedure and we're using that right now as an adjunct to external beam treatment and our own, in our own uh, institution the use of that modality has been increasing substantially. I think we've uh, treated over a hundred men as of, uh, well, I think we're now up to about 150 men there. Anyway, the proportion of men receiving this as part of their care is increasing just because we've been impressed with its side effect profile and effectiveness. So locally, our use of brachytherapy is increasing. Um, it is endorsed as a standard treatment option by, by numerous um, uh, professional society guidelines. Okay. Uh, what role might genomic testing play in identifying patients at greater or lesser risk for late toxicity in uh, radiotherapy? Sorry, you caught me off guard there. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you repeat that I one? I can Sorry. say that again. Yes. What role might genomic tests play in identifying ah. patients at greater or lesser risk for late toxicity? Ah, for toxicity. Well, I can say there is an increasing role for genomic tests that uh, may inform whether or not a patient really needs radiotherapy or not. For example, in a patient who's had a prostatectomy, right now we rely on fairly, um, I guess you could say, we classical or traditional factors to try to determine whether radiotherapy is, is needed afterward. The Gleason score, the extent of the, the cancer uh, when looked at under the microscope by the pathologist, the PSA after surgery, but there, I think it's fair to say there's really an increasing role for uh, molecular-based diagnostic tests, which may better allow us to tailor intensified treatment after surgery in those who really will derive a benefit for, from it, rather than relying on traditional tests. Now, I'm not so familiar with uh, genomic tests that have been used to uh, make predictions about like, toxicity. I think we're less far along. Oh, that would that would be really a holy grail if we could have a genomic test that we could apply upfront and that would predict those men who are at higher risk of side effects from radiotherapy and they could be steered towards other treatments, that would be truly a holy grail, but I, I think we're still a ways off from that. Okay. Uh, given the invasiveness of biopsy and the risk of infection, uh, especially with growing antibiotic resistance, why is MP MRI not used in advance of biopsy? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'd like to start by saying that um, Certainly the risk of infection after biopsy uh, is important and we are actively actually taking steps and have taken steps over past years in Ottawa to try to minimize uh, these risks and have been fairly successful at uh, reducing the risk to close to 1% uh, or even less and we're continuing uh, to do so. Uh, the role of MRI prior to biopsy is uh, still in evolution. I think that there may be a time in the, in the near future where uh, there is a standard role for MRI prior to biopsy. But before we introduce a new technology like MRI uh, prior to biopsy, we need to evaluate it and make sure that it is effective and accurate. It's possible that when you introduce a new technology, if you do so without properly studying it with rigorous research, that you could actually do more harm than good because perhaps the MRI would start to identify lesions that uh, are not Proper, are not proper for biopsy and patients would in fact suffer side effects uh, and, and we would cost the system a tremendous amount of money that we could therefore not direct uh, to other resources uh, because we did not study the technology properly. So we are in the process of uh, studying MRI prior to biopsy around the world and uh, hopefully in the future we will identify that uh, it is helpful. But until we do, I think we need to proceed cautiously. Excellent. Uh, why are trials such as immunotherapy not done in patients at an earlier stage, such as low-risk patients, when they have few comorbidities and better immune function 
thus improving chances, for success, chances of a successful outcomes. I think, as, uh, I think it was Rodney that had shown that um, often when new therapies are introduced, that we introduce them in patients with advanced disease where patients may not have any other treatment options and it's kind of like a proof of principle to see if this drug is effective in that situation. And then from there, sometimes these drugs move into earlier and earlier stages. So at this point, at least to my understanding, I think the, the jury's a little bit out in terms of immunotherapy for prostate cancer and I think we need some more data uh, before we can move it into earlier disease and you know you also have to look at efficacy but you have to look at side effects and these drugs do have toxicity and we want to make sure that we aren't subjecting people to toxicity with no benefits but I can say for other GU malignancies like we use immunotherapy and bladder cancer for patients who have metastatic disease but there's a lot of interest in moving that into earlier stages of disease for people who have very superficial bladder cancers. So that's not to say in the future immunotherapy may play an <coughs> earlier role in uh, prostate cancer, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay. Uh, is PM, PSMA just an enhanced P, uh, PET scan? Yes. Yeah. So, you want to go, go ahead, Luke, sir. Well, I'll just... Uh, uh, briefly say that a PSMA is um, a target on a prostate cancer cell that we can target and it's a type of uh, PET scan. So PSMA or choline and there are various uh, molecules that uh, can be used. Uh, there are various molecules that can be used for targeting or various targets on cells uh, that we can use uh, with PET technology uh, to try to identify prostate cancer or other cancers uh, in the body. Okay. How does a patient decide between surgery, surgery or radiotherapy? And if you feel you've answered some of these, just let me know. I'm not sure. So this is the question that I spend probably half of my clinic time discussing with patients and that they reflect on at length and it's a very, very difficult decision. Um, there are um, certain factors that would favor uh, a particular patient to a particular treatment, but they're often uh, viable options, surgery or radiotherapy for the vast majority of patients and really for many patients uh, it's a, a decision about which side effect profile they could live with best. Every treatment has side effects. A treatment without side effects is a treatment without effect and radiotherapy and surgery are no different. Um, but for some patients it's really the particular uh, side effects that they feel w that would impair their quality of life least. For example, radiotherapy carries with it a risk of altered bowel habit to some extent. A proportion of men will have some alteration in their bowel habit as a result of radiotherapy. And if a man at the outset already has some disturbance in bowel habit, then that might be a factor which would subtly push him towards uh, considering a surgical option. It's usually not considerations of effectiveness in my experience that would would uh, influence one or the other. And we do have now some comparative uh, data to suggest that really they're quite comparable in terms of effectiveness. It's often side effect profiles. Okay. Uh, what other work is being done to use PCA tracers to, del to, de to deliver chemotherapy or other treatments directly to the PCA cells where they live? So I think this speaks to the idea of trying to specifically target uh, cancer cells compared to normal cells and uh, a lot of traditional therapies that Dr. Canil talked about, we sort of have to treat all the cells and, and uh, the reason why the cancer cells die preferentially is because they're more rapidly dividing cells but uh, often these therapies affect other dividing cells like hair cells and things like that. Uh, so I think uh, newer therapies as I talked a little bit about, uh, you know, viral therapy for example which has a preference uh, to infect uh, cancer cells as opposed to normal cells is one of those ways. And, and obviously with all of our systemic treatments, what I mean by that is treatments that sort of affect all cells, we are trying to affect as much as we can the cancer cell and as little as we can the cells that are, we want to be wor working normally. And so it's a part of the goal and I think all therapies we're aiming to do that. Sometimes we can, uh, sometimes it's impossible and uh, to try and find that balance is uh, what we're working toward. Okay. Uh, hemoclip migration, how do you prevent this from happening? Do you use hemoclip uh, using robotic surgery? So the answer is yes. You saw those, uh, we call them hemolock clips, those plastic white clips. You saw my assistant come in and put on the, uh, 
blood vessels. Um, they're used in every robotic surgery um, without exception, although some centers do use a titanium clip, which is what we use mostly when we do open surgery. Uh, these are completely inert. What they're talking about is that there are times when these clips, maybe weeks or months after the surgery, will sort of come off the tissue because the tissue has sort of shriveled up. Um, and the clip will come off and it will migrate down and sometimes come in to the urethra or into the urinary tract. Uh, it's not a very common thing. It's, it happens, I think, fairly rarely. We can usually pick it up when the patient comes in complaining of prolonged urethral pain after their surgery or they're having bleeding that we don't really have any other reason to expect. And in fact, in most of these cases, we just go back again, give them a quick anesthetic and just pull the clip out and no harm done. Most of them are greatly improved thereafter. It's a fairly rare thing. There's re I don't think there's anything you can do other than try not to put too many of these clips down near where the connection with the bladder and the, and the uh, urethra goes. But it's, um, it's a recognized thing, but, but fairly unusual. Okay. Uh, so this uh, person says, some five years ago at the Ottawa Hospital, they were using a, an outdated blood test for detecting the spread of cancer. Has that been updated? Are they referring? Hmm. Potentially alkaline phosphatase would be what I can think of. I mean, there's really been no other blood marker other than PSA. Alkaline phosphatase... Yes. phosphatase, it, it basically is a marker of bony disease. Um, and, uh, you know, we still actually use it now in advanced cancer, once again. I know that Dr. Canil has uh, ordered an ALP. That's the only thing that I can think of. Chris, you're thinking of acid phosphatase, yeah, which is I, entirely I, different. I'm not sure what marker this is, to be yeah. honest, okay. so I don't know whether it's okay. worthwhile. Fair enough. It. How does the Ottawa Hospital roll out the latest practical technology to the entire team involved in prostate cancer treatment? So I would assume you're talking about things like robotics. Um, robotics was, so we've been doing it for about six years now. And it was, this is a bit of a toughie. We, uh, different centers do different things. and There are different models that you can use. So some centers had like one surgeon start doing robotics as the first person. So they got the highest volume. In our opinion, that model suffers a little bit in that you lose that kind of interaction between practitioners that we find extremely useful. So we, we used a model that was more inclusive. Uh, we basically had not just all of the uro-oncologists start, but some of our laparoscopic specialists who had done some prostate cancer purely laparoscopically. We felt that having the group of us starting and interacting was a better way of, of uh, being able to bounce ideas off each other, learn from each other. We had uh, Dr. Bro, who trained at Mayo Clinic, was trained in robotics, so he came back as kind of a mentor. So it was, a, it was nice for me that after having trained him during his residency, he came back and trained me. And it's kind of nice to see <laughs> that um, turnaround. So, in fact, he's still training me today. <laughs> so, so I think that the... Um, that was the model that we used. We thought it was highly successful. Uh, we also went straight to a team approach with gynecology and, and, uh, sur and uh, urology, where we used the same small group of nurses, anesthesiologists, and others involved in the care of the patient, rather than just having people rotating in and out like we do in most of our ORs. Worked really well. What we were looking for is kind of a plug and play thing where you just get a surgeon, but the team's ready to roll. So, whatever day is, the, the, whatever surgeon it is that day, the team is set to go. We do things the same way every time. And it worked out very well. One of the ways that we can measure that success is that we were the fastest robotic uh, team in Canada to reach 200 cases, which I think is not necessarily just, oh, hey, we can do 200. It's like we're efficient enough to reach 200 and do it very well. And I think that that model, other people have come and talked to us about it, and I think they've learned from it. So there are different ways, but that's the way we did it at Ottawa Hospital. I just wanted to add, and I know Dr. Marsh would agree, that uh, you know, the goal of the team in Ottawa was to make sure that every single patient would receive excellent care, no matter which surgeon uh, they met. And that's why the robotics program was rolled out the way that it was. And I, I personally feel 
uh, as I've observed the evolution of the program, that it's been very successful uh, both in its initiation and today as it's more mature. I'm going to speak very briefly to the rollout of uh, new radiotherapy techniques. So I, I mentioned a case there uh, where we had used stereotactic radiotherapy, the high precision radiotherapy targeted at a particular area in the bone. Uh, we have a few members of our group who have a number of years of experience with that and as we expand the members of our group that are offering this treatment, what we've instituted is a, a program of what we call peer review and what that means is that um, for anybody who um, has less experience with the new technique, the radiotherapy plan, which is sort of like the uh, topographic map that, that we showed you there, the isodose distribution is reviewed by a second more experienced radiation oncologist before a patient's ever uh, treated. So there's a second set of eyes looking at the, the plan to make sure it's safe um, as, a, as a, uh, a way of ensuring quality. Thank you. Uh, do any of you expect that a permanent cure may be found for this disease in the near future? Tough one. Well, I'd like to start by saying that there are thousands of men in, in Ottawa who have been cured from their prostate cancer uh, with existing therapies, uh, radiation therapy or surgery. Um, and I think what the question goes to are for people who have metastatic disease where there currently are no cures, um, is there a chance of cure? And I think that, as I said sort of during my talk, that is an overarching goal for, for our team here and, and across the world as we collaborate with, with other centers is we are trying our best uh, to find a cure and it's obviously very complicated. Uh, but when we look at the acceleration of our knowledge and the acceleration of therapies, um, I think many people will be cured in the future and that cure may come in the way of not having any treatments or the cure may come in a way where uh, a cancer which otherwise would have caused someone to die can be managed as more of a chronic disease. So yes, there may be some medications but you would live your normal life expectancy hopefully with as few side effects as possible uh, until a ripe old age where you die. Um, in a skydiving accident at the age of 120. <laughs> I mean, as a medical oncologist, uh, I agree with that. So, I mean, what we may be looking at here for patients with advanced disease is turning it into something that's chronic. And so that patients, I mean, we all die eventually, unfortunately, but the reality is they may die of something else. They may die with prostate cancer as opposed to of prostate cancer and trying to mitigate um, impact on individuals' quality of life, either by the disease or by the toxicity of the treatments that we're recommending. Thank you. So there are still questions here and some very personal questions as well. Um, again, I will be sharing those and we'll see if we can get some of those answers as well. We powered through quite a few and I, uh, I do apologize if your question was not asked. We will work to get those answers. Thank you for the way that you answered these questions because uh, very helpful, very candid, uh, very hopeful, very honest. And so thank you for that. I uh, want to thank everybody. This, this portion now ends the Ottawa Hospital's um, uh, discussion. We have some incredible sessions still to come on other aspects of prostate cancer. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say it is a privilege to speak to so many patients every day and family members facing prostate cancer and what a miracle it is, absolutely humbling, when they choose to keep going and invest in what these doctors are doing to make it better for their brother and son and neighbor and father and anyone else. And so we will be here all day. I, again, uh, not to take anything away from the other wonderful folks here as well. Happy to chat with any of you uh, and thank you so much again.